てみたいな。<笑><笑>
since 1997, and uh, this is a tremendous set of papers, very insightful. Uh, this material was identified, synthesized. The spontaneous polarization was measured to be a few microcoulomb per centimeter squared. Curie temperature around 305 Kelvin. Um, and interestingly enough, right over the Curie temperature, there's a regime of ionic conductivity, which was detected through the frequency uh, dependent delicate spectroscopy. And the conductivity has an activation variable of about 600 millivolts. Actually, at the time, it wasn't so clear that something is fundamentally special about this material, except one detail, that if you look at the lattice constants across the transition, this material prefers to contract rather than expand as most ferroelectrics do, going into the ferroelectric state. So we entered this material through the lens of electromechanical response, which is not that surprising, given uh, the speciality of the Oak Ridge National Lab group uh, dealing with ferroelectrics. And uh, this is a, the orange curve here is the electromechanical hysteresis loop comparing to the blue curve from PZT. And you can see a couple of good news, or at least we saw a couple of good news. First of all, the loop from copper indium diphosphate is quite tall. It's about half or a third of the height of PZT, which is really good because we were concerned with such a small polarization, would we be even uh, able to detect anything? And secondly, it, it has an opposite sign. It looks like a minus sign of, of PZT. Um, so how do we explain this? Well, looking at the, um, uh, the most simplest approximation, uh, so basically the piezoelectric uh, D3 coefficient, uh, of all these terms, the only one we can uh, try to sort of blame on such an interesting performance is electrostriction. So we called for both large and negative electrostriction coefficient uh, on the order of uh, unity minus one uh, meter four Coulomb squared. Now, interestingly enough, this recipe for large negative electrostriction also enables us to explain the X-ray data and fit them to a fairly simple formula, uh, which combines uh, linear thermal lattice expansion with, lattice, uh, with uh, thermal expansion coefficient. And this uh, term, uh, which uh, uh, defines the compression in this case, or the change of the lattice constant uh, upon entering the ferroelectric state. And so with this expression, we were able to fit both A, B, and C lattice constants, also using the measured polarization values. And we came away with, with these uh, cubes. And what's nice about these electrostrictive values is that they agree overall with the prescriptions from PFM on the order of unity, but the highest one, Q3, is minus 3.2. And by themselves, these values are abstract, but if you compare them to what's known, uh, so the yellow figures here are traditional oxide ferroelectrics. So they're two orders of one to two orders of magnitude below. And this material exists with negative electrostriction uh, way up sort of in the land of soft and groupy things like polymers um, and foams, but still maintaining crystalline lines. So this does not have yet to do anything with the merger for electric and ionic properties. So we wanted to take a look where does this negative electrostriction come from. And this is where uh, 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 Andrew Rapp's former student uh, and the postdoc at the National Lab, John Bram, helped us a lot because we started looking in detail at the DFT calculation. Of course, we approached it with a very simple question. Negative electrostriction, negative piezo response implies that if we compress the material, polarization will go up. Most ferroelectrics do the opposite thing. They're in the type that if you compress the polarization, goes down. So we started compressing them in the computer. And of course, for a Vanderbilt solid, compression is very nice. You can accommodate arbitrary amounts of strain into the Vanderbilt's gap. And so starting with the very uh, expanded structure with 2% strain, uh, upon compression, uh, what, you see, what you observe is the existence of the structure. And it's very similar to what you find in ICSD. Uh, but the polarization increases with compression. And so this identifies negative electrostriction, negative longitudinal piezo response right away from the calculation. What was really interesting is that upon further compression, this material develops a new structural phase where the copper essentially pops out slightly into the Van der Waals gap. Doesn't seem like much, but it doubles the amount of polarization and also fundamentally switches the electromechanical response to energy into positive electrostriction. So this was very rich, and of course, this you can see already a little bit of the ionic motif, right? Copper has ability to displace sort of beyond the layer and possibly all the way into the layer. So phase coexistence implies, uh, with two polarization values, implies that something interesting is happening with the uh, ferroelectric potential. Well, 
and this is it. If you drag a copper ion across the layer, what you observe is a very rich structure. At zero strain, it's essentially a quadruple potential well, identifying the low and high polarization phases. But then with strain, uh, this potential well evolves. So at compressive strain, only the high polarization phase survives with copper in the, in, 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 in the um, Van der Waals gap. At high tensile strain, only the low polarization phase survives with copper uh, in the layer. And so it's a quadruple, tunable, and deep and harmonic potential. Well, you can see the, there's a very profound harmonicity. And this is essentially the explanation for the negative electrostriction, the low polarization phase, that as the system gets squeezed, the copper ion begins to feel the layers proximal, wants to displace toward the layers, and there's a nonlinear increase of spontaneous polarization, giving rise to negative longitudinal uh, piezo response. But we wanted to have a little bit more proof that the quadruple well in this system exists, and of course there's a prescription of four coexisting phases. So it turns out that with some deliberate work from my colleague Nina Balki, we have been able to see and label all four phases uh, at a single temperature and a single value of pressure. And this is a PFM image of the amplitude of PSA response. It's very involved, but if you uh, sort of statistically look at the uh, values represented here, um, there's a broad distribution of PSA response with roughly four peaks. Um, and these peaks, uh, you know, truly really remarkably, are in agreement with what you get for, uh, with calculations, with first principles calculations. So for the low polarization phase, we have about minus 15 picometers per volt, with a high polarization phase on the order of 3 picometers per volt, and indeed, uh, lining up these values looks like this. So we do not have an ironclad perfect agreement, but it's, it's, it's very close. So certainly very strong evidence that the phase coexistence and the quadruple well is real in this computer. Even more so is the evidence coming from pressure induced switching. We are able to switch between the two phases uh, by pressure in the computer, and we are also able to do it uh, in reality by loading this AFM tip with, with increasing force and observing how this pattern of piezo response evolves. It's completely non transparent to see this from the figure, although you do see some contrast evolving, but if we sort of histogrammatically dissolve it, this is the pattern. So as we increase the, uh, the applied pressure, Pretty much we stuck with four phases, and we end up with two phases with opposite polarization. And this is a fully reversible process. If you let go of the pressure, it restores back. So this is a very good news, right? It's an intrinsic material with an interesting structure. Now, quadruple well is sort of a gift from the, this incipient ionic behavior, where the atoms just slightly protruded the Van der Waals gap. What happens when you crank up the temperature and go proper ion? Well, it turns out that there's another stru uh, structural transition popping out at high temperatures so under 500 Kelvin uh, that sits about 200 degrees above the polar melting, that's a ferroelectric TC, and something like three or 400 degrees, uh, or 500 degrees below the decomposition of this material. And we've done a lot of work on this, uh, what this transition means. Let me show you my uh, mental molecular dynamic simulation. I apologize for... Uh, <laughs> It's incorrectness, but uh, the atoms are supposed to do that. So this transition corresponds to the melting of the cation sublattice. Not just copper mobility, but indium mobility. The P2S6, these composite anions, they're very big, they don't move, but everything in between starts to move around. So using this uh, flexibility at 500 Kelvin, we're able to control ferroelectricity in this material in one of two ways. First of all, uh, we can allow good and very long range um, equilibration of thermodynamics. So if we mix uh, two phases that are not fully compatible within the same material and allow it to slowly cool across the transition temperature, uh, we will end up with composites that from uh, the point of view of microscopy look like this, where you see sort of coexistence of these colored regions and black regions. And what this is, is a, a combination of Indium 4 thirds p 2 6 and copper indium p 2 6 within each individual layer. Right. So uh, what happens here is that we start with a copper deficient phase, and instead of arriving at the alloy, the system prefers to phase separate. And as a bonus, the indium uh, layers also strain the copper, allowing us to achieve the record uh, TC for this material that's been reported today. 
It's still not very high, but it's conveniently at room temperature, uh, which possibly is relevant for prospective applications. Um, so, for example, in electrical orders. Uh, but what's even more remarkable is that for each one of these um, the compositions, there's an added story that could be told. Uh, and then what we do is we go back to the phase diagram um, and start to cycle across the cathem uh, melting transition. And it's just you know, a simple sort of you know, phase separation. Uh, but it's interesting that we can get this in the crystalline solid. Uh, what happens is the faster we cool, the less time the system has to equilibrate. And so these domains go from mesoscale to almost nanoscale level. And associated with that is a dramatic suppression of the uh, transition temperature. And we can go from all the way from the record values we get in equilibrated alloys to something we can detect uh, in the cryos that was really used to measure. And it's very interesting to ponder what happens if the volume of the photoelectric phase becomes very small. Yesterday we heard a very interesting set of talks on various interesting dipolar structures, possibly toroids. We don't know what exactly is happening there. Maybe it's a small depolarizing effect. But nevertheless, doing this reversibly in the single material is pretty remarkable. That's pretty much what I have. Uh, we have observed the first many results from the merger of photoelectric and ionic material in this system. But there's much more to go on. Well, with respect to the quadruple well, there's the obvious question, how does this thing switch? I can tell you right away that this story is evolving. The switching is complicated and involves multiple phases, transitions, something we've never seen for a single ferroelectric. Then there's the obvious thing. Um, how does the well evolve when you start embedding it, in, for example, to the interfaces? What effect is going to have on proximate materials? What proximate materials, how they will affect the quadruple well? And then there's an interesting line of thought uh, dealing with the with ionic substitution. So we've already done sort of copper deficient compositions, but there's something rich hiding behind the sulfur selenium substitution diagram. It turns out, based on the electric spectroscopy, that all sorts of phases will emerge: ferroelectric, dipolar glass, incommensurate phases, possibly Lipschitz uh, critical points. So there's a lot of fundamentally interesting behaviors that could be achieved by controlling the sulfur selenium. Uh, substitution. Of course, I want to leave you with, with a kind of a little appetizer of what we're working on right now. It turns out that the selenium, we thought it was a boring material, but it's also a bit anomalous. The, uh, the sulfur was negative electric restriction. Selenium, well, this is the PFM image, and all you see are thin lines. They are the main walls, and they're the only things that the piezoelectric in the image. So, selenium develops piezoelectricity only localized in nanoscale regions. And we believe that this is the manifestation of the endophilolytic order and endophilolytic domain walls. And I'm sure we'll hear more about this in today's sessions, how the domain walls and endophilolytics are intrinsically interesting. That's all I have. I'd like to thank once again my um, uh, collaborators, the growing team of people who are involved uh, in this work, as well as many of my uh, collaborators from the National Lab and Center for Interface and Material Sciences and Oak Ridge National Lab for continued support of this direction. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to questions. So time for questions, comments. Ah, thank you very much. Very interesting talk this morning. Um, this is a multi-layered material. I think you're not looking at a monolayer sample. Am I right about that? That's correct. Yes, so then my question is, is there any way to see the switching dynamics and whether an entire layer switches?